Hey, what is going on guys? Today we are going to be revisiting the 2016 release of the real grade Shinanju, widely believed to be one of the worst real grades out there. We'll get into all that. I just want to say that this video, I'm not going to call it a Mythbusters video because on the last time that I did that, we had a couple of people go in in the comments and complaining, oh, this myth is not oh, busted, bust oh, just wait a month, just wait a couple, couple years and try to transfer the kit again, it's going to be the one the band totally unstable. Every single kit that Bandai puts out is not handcrafted by someone. It's coming from the same mold in the same factory. They put out tens of thousands of them in the idea that yours that you bought in 2012 in the Philippines and that guy's who he bought in 2014 in the US is gonna have any noticeable difference is just ridiculous. The possibility that there is some fairly super minute detail of the mold that made of any sort of difference in it is like a tiny grain of sand in the middle of the Sahara. It's just not a thing. Anyway, all of that aside, thank you to everyone who did watch and appreciate my review uh, revisiting the real grade Zeta. But just for reference, this real grade Shinanju is red label, which means that this is not a recent print. This came out from before Bandai switched over to the blue labels on all their kits. So this is not one that's been reprinted recently. I don't know exactly when this was printed from Bandai, but it's at least a few years old. So everybody knows that the real grade Shinanju has its issues and it comes down to the three main Fs. That is the fit, the frame, and the finish. Those are gonna be the three topics that we're gonna be talking about in this video. This is not going to be a review of the kit. I'm not going to do an unboxing of the kit. I've already done that in the past. I want to address these three main issues with this kit in this video. And there's one more point of very important context that we need to get out straight at the beginning of this video that I am coming at this from a modeler's perspective. And for me, there's multiple different ways to look at model building or model collecting. For me, in my point of view, there are two different ways to enjoy this hobby, either as a modeler or as a collector. And honestly, multiple shades of gray in between. You can be a modeler and a collector, and I think both of them are equally legitimate ways to enjoy this hobby. And I think from Bandai's perspective, they put out their model kits with both ends of that spectrum in mind as well. They make their kits so that people who just like to build and collect and maybe play with the models are able to do that most of the time, that's the idea. Or if you just want to build it just as strictly as a model and paint and do all the modifications and whatever, you can do that as well. And if you think about it, that perfectly explains why some modelers complain about Bandai kits being too easy and too simple because they're made to be easy for people who just want to build and collect them. And then some collectors complain about Bandai model kits as being too complicated or too finicky because they're not made to be played with necessarily, they're made to just be built as model kits. And so this kind of clashing of ideas ideas, everyone's right, and it just depends on your own personal perspective, and uh, at least for me, in my model kit reviews and build videos and everything, I try to keep everyone's perspective in mind, but I'll understand that my perspective is always going to be of the person, uh, of the modeling standpoint, that I look at these as models, things that are meant to be built, posed, and then not played with, but obviously some people are going to want to change the pose and play with them. That's just a different perspective from mine personally, but I perfectly respect that opinion. If that's what you guys want to do with it, I'll keep that in mind. But for the purposes of this video, I am looking at this in the context of this being a model, not an action figure. And if you want to get really scientific about it and go to the dictionary definition of a model, it says right here, a representation, generally a miniature to show the construction or appearance of something. So usually a miniaturized version of something, that's it. Whereas the dictionary definition of a toy is an object, often a small representation of something. Okay, yes, that sounds like a model, but here's the added bit. For children or others to play with, that is the important definitional difference between a model and a toy. A toy is meant to be played with, a model is not. Notice that that's missing from the definition of model. And for further evidence, in a lot of countries, they even put a little sticker on the box that says like not a toy or for example, mine here in Korean, it says there that it's a hobby product for an adult, not made for children. And it says above 15, which uh, above 15, I think would still constitute a child in my opinion. But anyway, my point is, look, if you want to buy a model kit and you want to play with it, that's fine. But I don't think it's really then fair to criticize the model kit for not being able to withstand some play time when that's not, at least in my opinion, what they're meant to do. So with all that context in mind, let's go ahead and crack open the box and get to work on addressing the issues with the Shinanji. So among the fit, finish, and frame, I think the frame is by far the worst issue with this kit, and that is because they're using Advanced MS Joint 5 
from the year 2012. When this kit came out in 2016, that's because this MS joint was made for the Gundam Mark II, a much smaller mobile suit in comparison, with the Mark II coming in at around 19 meters tall and the Shinanju coming in at around 22 and a half meters tall. So right off the bat, with the overall size difference between the two mobile suits, you can see how this frame could become a problem as this frame needs to support a lot more weight with a larger size mobile suit than it was originally designed to support. And while the real grade Mark II is, in my opinion, the best of the early real grade kits and still holds up very well to this day, this frame works great in that kit, it does not work very well in this kit, so we will have to see what we can do about strengthening certain areas of the build to make sure that the frame is actually able to hold up the weight of, say, the waist section, the arms, the legs, and all that, so you're not having weight issues with this kit. Now the fit and finish of this kit, I consider it to be less pressing issues because, honestly, for the fit, if you have certain parts that are tending to fall off very easily, Basically, the solution is just to just glue them. Unless they're moving parts, then you might have a little bit more of an issue, and we'll tackle those issues as we encounter them throughout the build. As for the finish, this also is not necessarily an issue if you plan on repainting the kit, which I do. If you don't plan on repainting the kit, then you might have this problem. Fortunately, though, all of the gold pieces are undergated, so you don't really need to worry too much about those. The problem is with some of the high gloss red pieces. These are not all undergated, so you will have some areas where the gate that you're cutting then is going to leave a nub mark that is going to be in an exposed area. So whatever your typical method for getting rid of nub marks, which should include sanding, sanding away this high gloss finish is not ideal. So you need a different way to do that or you need to find a way to be able to sand and then bring back that high gloss finish. And it's relatively easy to do that. Obviously, the easiest way would just be to use a polishing compound, but even if you don't use that, you can do it still pretty well, even without the polishing compound. And let's go ahead and take off this part here and use it for an example. Now, you got one, two, three gates on there. None of them are under gates, and all of them are going to show on the finished model. So you got these small ones, which are not that big of an issue, but then you got this quite large one over here, which if you guys have built any models before, you know that the larger the gates, it's a little bit more tricky. First thing you're gonna wanna do is number one, use a pretty good set of sharp single blade nippers. Those would be ideal. And then you're going to not cut directly up against the parts. Cut a little bit further away. In this case, I'm gonna leave a lot of space because when you have a really thick gate like that, it's much easier to damage the piece. So give yourself plenty of room on that and cut a lot. And even on those smaller gates, I left quite a bit left over. Now you can cut that down a little bit shorter if you want right here on these I will just go ahead and cut that down making a second cut there still I'm intentionally not cutting right up against the plastic because I just you just don't really want to do that in general same thing for this larger one I'm gonna cut a little bit more away but I still want to leave a little bit on there next step for me would then just be to shave that down a little bit further carefully with a knife now I know people always freak out about the way that I cut towards myself you shouldn't do that you should cut away from yourself if possible it's just super uncomfortable for me so just do whatever is safe and comfortable for you the point is you're not trying to lop off the whole thing all at once you just kind of want to shave away at it and i usually will slice from one side take a little bit off rotate the part around take a little bit off from the other side and this ensures you're not cutting off like too much or gouging into the part which is what you definitely want to avoid there we go mine's looking a little bit rough because i was intentionally a little bit over ambitious with that just to, for, uh, to, for an example for you guys and that tore a little bit there as well that whiteness that you're seeing is actually a little bit of that plastic torn because this has a little bit more than just that big gate mark there there is also a mold line which wraps around the top of there so cutting away that mold line then kind of ripped the plastic a little bit so what's the next step now what can you do i'm just going to use a soft type sanding stick which was originally a 600 grit sanding stick but as you can see it's kind of well used now it's probably closer to like 800 or even a thousand now at this point and the reason that i always recommend soft type sanding sticks is because they're soft enough not to flatten out your curved surfaces and hard enough not to round off your flat surface this is like a little bit flattish kind of surface there so this one is going to be perfect for that and then as you can see i'm kind of like rubbing it that's also an easy way to get rid of like little white stress marks and stuff from your nose just give it a little Give it a little rub with your thumbnail, give it a little rub with your sweaty fingers. And even after that, you can see it lost a little bit of shine here on the front. 
but we can even buff that even more. I'm gonna use my balancer here from the Gun Primer Razor set, which as you can see is also kind of already beat up, but it's the only thing that I have at the moment. But some buffing with this should be enough to get it pretty close to being back to shiny again. And after a little bit of buffing and just some more wiping away, there you can see we got that shine pretty much all the way back to what it was before or just what it should be to match the rest of the part and you can never tell that there was a big number up there. Now the other problem that you're gonna have with these is just mold lines. You got this mold line I mentioned before, it wraps around the top and then cuts right across the part there so that line is not supposed to be there. Sanding that away obviously going to be a lot more work and why if you're not planning on painting this kit but you want to make it look its best, you do have a fair amount of work cut out for you if you want to actually remove all the mold lines and everything on here as well. Still maintain that high gloss red finish of just the bare plastic. And speaking of the gum primer razor, and again, this is just what I have. If you guys want to use a different particular brand of glass file or whatever, that's fine. I'm just saying that glass files can also be quite good for this, especially on flat surfaces like this, like removing this guy here with a glass file can be easy, but on rounded surfaces, that's where you're gonna have a problem using a glass file. But on particular high gloss kits like this, clear color kits like that, glass files can work quite well for those. Here's that, after treated with just the glass file, I didn't use a buffer or anything else on that, so even just the glass file by itself can oftentimes be enough to just get rid of the nub and keep that glossy surface looking very nice. So that's a couple of ways to deal with the high gloss red. Now dealing with the gold, like I said, it's mostly undergated, so removing the nubs and keeping the gold on that is pretty easy to do. That said, if you are planning on repainting the kit, which I am, I want to remove the gold and for that I'm gonna be using this product. It is a more modeling multi-cleaner. It's obviously a Korean product, so if you guys are not in Korea, you won't have access to this, but you can just check. The best way would be to check with like local modeling groups or modelers who you know in your area or in your country what products they would use or would recommend. There's a lot of different products. I can't give you guys any good recommendations because you're watching this video from all over the world, I would imagine, and so every country is gonna have different products available, but this is simply for stripping model paint which is basically what this gold finish is. And so I cut off a piece of the runner here and I've got it just testing to see how this is gonna work in this liquid and it's already coming off here. So the liquid is clear and the reason why it looks like pee now is because that's all the yellow paint. So basically what this is, is yellow plastic and then coated with chrome uh, coating and then clear yellow on top of that. So the clear yellow paint comes off right away, super easy, that's what's making the liquid clear. The chrome takes a little bit longer and uh, that's brushed off just with a toothbrush. I've had this in there for about 10 minutes and then brushed it with a toothbrush and you can see that's starting to come off, revealing the yellow plastic underneath. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this for all of the gold parts for this kit. I'm just gonna uh, get a larger cup than this toss all of the gold plated parts into this solution, leave it overnight, brush that all off tomorrow, and then we can move forward with the build. So while we're waiting on those parts, I just want to pose a question to you guys. What do you normally like to do in your downtime, like while you're waiting for paint to dry or something like that? One thing that I like to do is I keep a few books around because it's kind of one of the things that I always try to work on is trying to just read more stuff in general. So I usually keep a couple of books around here. And if you guys like uh, graphic novels, a kind of comic book sort of thing. If you like reading that, then I want to also now take a moment to tell you guys about this new series coming out here. Mavericks is a graphic novel that's coming out and the team reached out to me to let you guys know about this because obviously we kind of share a common interest about this. If you're into science fiction stories with giant robots fighting in battle, that kind of sounds right up our alley, right? So if you're interested in like Titanfall, obviously like Gundam 8th MS team, which is one of my favorite series uh, in the Gundam universe. I love 8th MS team. If you like that, sort of like a gritty combat warfare, also similar like an Armored Core front mission or something like that. If you guys are interested in that type of genre stuff, then this is worth checking out. So like I said, the team is currently raising funds on Indiegogo and the deadline is coming up on September 20th. So I just wanted to let you guys know a little bit about this. And obviously the link to the Indiegogo page will be down below with all the full details. Uh, but first, let me just play the trailer for you guys because that kind of shows it very well. And then we can talk about some more of the other details. War is a topic of vital importance. A subject of inquiry that cannot be ignored. It is a matter of life and death. It can be a road to safety or to ruin. In an alternate version of our world, brought to the brink of total collapse, 
rival nations fight for global domination and elite pilots in futuristic combat suits wage war on the battlefield of tomorrow now six brave soldiers on a seemingly routine rescue mission will encounter more than they bargained for and uncover a dangerous secret that could change their world if they live long enough to see it. So there you have it guys, like I said, it looks very exciting. Now, if you take a look at the Indiegogo page here, which like I said, the link will be down in the video description below. It has all the details on all the different uh, levels of backing, all the uh, perks and everything for that. So there's all sorts of stuff. Like if you just want the digital download, uh, you've got that on here. There is also just the basics. You can go all in by getting like the fully loaded campaign box, which has a bunch of cool stuff like a tier exclusive wraparound cover, variant cover for that that is exclusive to that, as well as a set of dog tags in there, which will be individually numbered. So you'll be able to go onto the website and make your own personal profile in there, which is pretty cool. My personal favorite though, I think is the spare magazine option. And the reason is because there's actually five different versions of this and whichever, whichever different version you choose uh, comes with a different print of that. I really love the A variant because that artwork really reminds me of like 80s sci-fi, like Aliens cover like Ripley or something like that, which is super cool. But I think personal favorite is probably C. I just really like the design of that one, the color scheme of it's very cool. Uh, so that's probably my favorite among the set. So there's information on all the levels and the stretch goals and everything on here. So make sure you guys check that out. There is also some add-ons as well. The supply drop looks very cool. You've got a lunchbox, travel mug, a flash drive there loaded with some secret stuff on there. So like some more added content added on that. And probably my favorite thing, of course, is the 3D printed, uh, 3D resin printed statue that you get with that. So that'll be fun to get if you guys like painting minis. That will be a really cool one. So make sure you guys check this out. Obviously, there's t-shirts on here as well. And just on a personal note, guys, uh, you know I don't like to hammer you with like commercials and stuff like that. That's why I'm never going to have like an advertisement for like Raid Shadow Legends or something that's completely unrelated. When the team reached out to me uh, to do this promo for you guys, uh, the only reason I agreed is because I think this actually looks very cool. And it is something that I think is that would be of interest to like people like us who are interested in giant robots. And if you're like me and also love uh, like science fiction stuff, and especially like 80s sci-fi, that this looks really cool, like sci-fi action. And aside from that, I just know how much work goes into to creating something like this so I think these guys are working super hard on this project and I think they deserve some support so if you guys are also interested you know I would just recommend just go there and check out see the different options there's a lot of different options for that so even if you just want to support a little bit and just be able to just read and just enjoy the graphic novel there's options for that or if you want to throw some more support their way there's a lot of stuff that you can get uh, from the different perks and options uh, here for this so it's very cool and I want to give the guys that are working on that a, you know big pat on the back for all the work they've done already I think it's gonna be a really cool project I'm looking forward to reading it myself personally and so I hope you guys also uh, take some interest in that but that all said I think our parts should be ready now and we can get back to the Shinanju Okay guys, so a few days later I finally got the kit all put together, All or most of the sanding I think is done. I may end up having to go and do a little bit more once we get to the painting, but for now the kit is all together, the weapons are all together, and there's some glue on the fuel tanks because there's seam lines on those. So I'm just waiting for that glue to cure a little bit and let's uh, do some more sanding on those just to get rid of that excess glue. There's also a little bit of glue on the grenade launcher uh, for the seam line on that, but on the main kit itself there's not really any seam lines to worry about, so that's good. Now like I said before, this is not going to be a rehash of the review. I don't want to go into doing that, talking about all the articulation and everything. If you want to see more about that, go ahead and check the original review. But for now, we're going to talk about the fit issue because there are definitely aspects of the kit that are going to cause you problems about the just like falling off after certain times and everything. Probably the most notable would just be the knee. This knee part tends to come off quite easily because it's just kind of barely held on there by it is a little bit right on there. But another one here would also be the toe, which is not, I mean like I'm pulling it off now, but I just know 
from building and the kit and working with it before that the toe piece does tend to kind of fall off. Although I'm experiencing it now, it does feel like tighter than I remember it being the first time. It could also just be due to like some, some sanding dust or something like that being caught up in there. Another weak point is going to be here in the forearm as like this whole front part is basically just plugged onto the end of the frame. So that's the end of the Mark II frame. Not really sure whether to file this particular part under the fit or the frame because it kind of has to do with both. Because on the original Mark II frame, that's where you plug in the hand, but the Shinanju's arms are bigger and longer, so you have this extra section that you're plugging onto there. And it basically just like plugs onto the, that part, and it's not that really strong of a connection. So as you're moving the kit around, this might tend to pop off on you. And so these are kind of like the main three issues that I've really noticed about like parts being loose. And as you can see, they're not even all that bad. But if you are going to be handling the kit, you might find these parts to be a little bit loose uh, in the fit. Fortunately, they're all non-moving parts. So this one, you can just put a little bit of super glue on that. And that is what I'll ultimately do later after painting, just to make sure it is good and tight. A little bit of super glue on there. That's not going to bother anything. Here on the knee, once again, just a little bit of super glue on there. Glue that onto there. It's not going to bother any of your articulation. And then the toe as well, just a little bit of super glue in there pop that on there and that's not going to bother anything. So the fit issue of this is pretty easy to fix. There's nothing that can't be fixed by a tiny little drop of super glue as far as the fitting goes. So that brings us to the last point, which is the frame, which I really couldn't address very much until we got actually the kit together. And then now we can really experience what the issues with the frame is going to be. And the first one you may notice is that the top half of the body and the lower half of the body it's kind of wobbly in between because the connection between the top and the bottom half of the body is there's actually the top half of the frame and the hip part of the frame from the Mark II. But this kit, because it again needs to be a little bit larger, there's another section kind of built in between that actually connects them now. And that's the section that's going to be causing it a little bit of an issue. And that's why earlier you saw me resting it against this part here like that because the kit is not going to be able to stand up on its own. So the issue of the kit just not being able to stand up in a neutral pose just on its own like that, I just don't think that there's anything that really that you can do about it because it's just a matter of the weight on the back and there's nothing that you can do to reduce the weight. So you could change the pose. And obviously having the weapons and the shield in the mix will also help to counterbalance the weight. And you can see both of the knees already fell off and me just trying to fix the pose here to something like this. But here you go, something like that. If you change the pose, you can get it to stand up on its own in a way that you kind of have it leaning over or bent over or something like that in a way that makes it less back heavy. So it is possible to get it standing on its own, I think, but ultimately the best option for this is just gonna be putting it up on an action base. That's kind of the best way to counteract uh, the weight of this. That's not an issue that there's really anything that you can do to modify the actual kit, aside from like putting weights into the kit or something, which I feel like is just something most people are probably just not gonna be interested in doing. It's just much easier to just put it up on a base or something, and that's what I'm gonna be doing. So I think the best way to move forward with testing the frame and figuring out any issues that we're going to need to work on more is just to try out a couple poses. Like I said, considering this kit as a model kit, I would really only ever pose it maybe a couple times before figuring out a pose that I wanted to stick with. But if I am unable to actually hold a pose with the frame completely unmodified or completely unfixed, then that would be an issue or something that I would need to fix. We're not necessarily looking for fixes that would need to be made to the frame in order to continuously pose and repose and repose and repose and play with the kit. Those are things that would come up. There could possibly be issues that would come up if you were to treat the kit in that way, but that's not how we're going to be addressing the kit today. So we'll just immediately say that it seems like that looseness in the waist is not really gonna be causing that much of an issue. It is a little bit loose and like, I would think that it could be a problem bending the kit forward if you're trying to take advantage of the ab crunch and the back weight kind of then pulling it back. That might be something we'll take a look at just for being able to keep a good solid ab crunch pose. But honestly, at the moment, my main issue is more so with how the shield attaches onto the back of the arm. Now, there is another piece that will allow you to, to attach the shield up to the underside of the shoulder armor, which I always just thought looked stupid. I'm not even going to bother with that because I just thought that just it's just silly. Anyway, I'm going to be keeping the shield on the back of the arm. And so number one issue is just going to be the weight. As you're noticing, it's kind of drooping down there like that. And the other issue is just the fact that it's on the back of the arm. It just looks really uncomfortable. Like you're never actually going to be able to block anything with a shield unless you have the arm like really bent like this. And then you have the shield like up blocking like this way or something or just having the arm in some really awkward pose. So it would just make a lot more sense that the shield was on the side of the arm it just or at least like partially on the side or something like that. 
and also just the connector in general even if you did want to keep it on the back of the arm the connection is not very good so it's kind of like just barely hanging on to there and this is before we even get the effect parts on there because if we just go ahead and swap these around and put on the effect parts as we'll see i think the weight is going to be even more of a problem and so we're not going to make it easy on the kit we're using the shorter beam effect parts we're going to go for the full length beam effect parts both of them added onto there and it looks like it's holding the pose right but that's only because the beam effect is resting on the leg if i lift this up if the shield doesn't fall off the arm you're going to notice that the arm is not going to be able to hold up the weight so that's lifted up there and it's just going to immediately fall down so definitely there's going to be an issue there in the shoulder and if we deconstruct this a little bit it's going to be pretty easy to figure out exactly where the problem lies just take off that top piece of armor and you can see there's two points of articulation one is inside there which would be the mark II frame and the next one is this next point of articulation here which is the new parts that part is actually really tight so this uh, end of the shoulder joint very tight and that's not going to give you any problems the problem is once again from the mark II frame so it really just kind of depends on what you want to do with the pose now one really easy thing to do if you wanted to have like an upward pose like that and you wanted to make sure that that's not going to be then sinking back down one thing that you could do is just like cut a piece of plot blade or something like that to stick up inside of there and basically have that be a wedge to block this from falling back down if you want to keep it in one pose forever again or you could even make it a removable piece or just stick a piece in there temporarily just a piece of plot plate in there something that would just hold up this joint and make it impossible for it to then sink back down that would be the easiest thing to do now while we're here there is another loose piece on the kit that i did forget about before and that would be the head the head pops off very easily on this one it's a pretty simple fix what i would recommend you guys to do just put a little bit of super glue or a fingernail polish or a little bit of paint or even just like a little piece of like tissue paper uh, up inside of there just something to make this ball joint or just something to tighten the fit between this ball joint and the inside of the head that's going to be super easy to fix and again it's only if you're really like touching the kit the head is just not going to fall off on its own but while handling the kit and everything moving around moving it around to try out different poses you will notice that it comes off kind of easily but again really not that big of a deal Another area that I was kind of concerned about was the legs. I was worried that the legs are kind of heavy, so is the kit going to actually be able to hold up the legs in a wide pose without those sinking back down just due to gravity? And so far, I'm not noticing any issue with that. So I think the hip joint is actually totally fine. It's really only gonna be the shoulder joint. This middle section joint, which could be a problem, like I said, if we're trying to keep it in like an ab crunched pose. So we'll try to address that, the shoulder joint, and just the ability of the shield to plug on in a way that is more secure and maybe like a little bit more comfortable position. Those are gonna be kind of our main things that we need to fix about the frame, essentially. All right, so once we've disassembled the body a little bit here, and then we can address those issues. Now, if we take a look in the torso section, the problem with the ab crunch is that there's like four different joints between here. There's a couple pieces that I've removed, but right here in the center, there's a double ball joint. So the range of movement forward and back for that is quite large. So you can see there is all the way back and there it is all the way front. It's not that much, but it's enough. It's like half a centimeter or something like that, five, six, maybe even seven millimeters there, which is gonna add up. So if you did want to keep this in an ab crunched pose like that forward and not to be pulled back by the backpack, easiest thing I think would probably be just shoot some super glue up in there uh, just to fill in this space, either that or even some like epoxy putty or something. Just pack in some epoxy putty around this, let that cure and then that'll just be hard and that will stop that from bending. If you wanted a temporary option, what you can do is just cut pieces of plot plate like this that you can stick in there. You have to file it down to a size that will fit in there in this one way. Or just pieces of plot plate, just like stack a plot plate to whatever thickness that you need to basically be a wedge in there that you can wedge in here. And that will stop that from bending more. And that is something that you could then disassemble the kit and take out again easier later if you wanted to change the pose for whatever reason. And if I can just real quick reassemble the parts here on the bottom, you can see what I mean. So here's another point where that's going to bend forward like that. Right here, you can see what I mean. This is just a, a filed down, cut off piece of runner here. And you just wedge that into place. And you could even just put a little dot of glue on that just to keep it in place. Something that's not going to hold it on there forever, but at least just something that will keep it in place. Just a little dot of plastic cement will be fine. And then that will keep that from bending back again as long as that little kind of spacer is in there. It's a pretty easy fix to sort out the ab crunch of that. I'm not going to set anything in permanently now at the moment because I still have to disassemble and paint and all that, but I think you guys can see what I mean on that one. Now for the arm, I'm just going to go ahead and put this piece of armor back here on the side because that's what we'll need in this case because without that, if you take a look at this side, you could glue or pin something maybe up in here in the frame, but honestly I think the easiest way would be just to take this piece of armor and basically what we're going to be doing is utilizing this flat surface which is basically like the underside of the armpit and you can either once again glue or just temporarily set a piece right in there 
So like we've got our cutoff piece of runner right here. So basically it is gonna be setting that into the armpit basically on the top of this section. And this gives you a nice surface there to glue that down if you wanted to. But if we go over here, you can see you can just kind of wedge this into there. And once we've got that in place, again, you can pretty that up by uh, making that so it fits in there better. I'm just kind of showing you guys temporarily just so you can get the idea. But then, as you can see, that's not going to be able to move down at all. Where on this side, that's moving up and down. But on this side, now that's wedged, stuck into place. That's not going to be moving anyway. There's no amount of weight that you can add to that that's going to be able to sink that arm down any further. So that brings us to the third and most difficult thing that's going to be able that we're going to want to fix on this one. And this is something honestly totally subjective. I just personally don't like the placement of the shield on this. You guys may be perfectly fine with the placement of the shield on the back of the arm. That's what I want to fix on this. If you did want to keep this permanently more solid on the back of the arm without it kind of falling off easily, again, I think the easiest thing to do would be just to add a little bit of glue on that. Not really that big of a deal. Pretty easy fix. And that'll be because as it is, it's solid enough. It's not like it's falling off super easily. But if you just wanted a little bit added security, just a little bit of glue would be fine. But if we take off this mount here, we can address the issue because this part still needs to clamp onto the back of the arm as it is. But what we want is this part instead of being on the back to be over here on the side. And so I think what we're going to do is just get rid of that and then just make this so that it's just glued or fixed permanently here to the side of the arm right there like that. So after I've cut the bar off the back of there, I'm just gonna file this down so that it's just nice and flat and round across the back of that there. Once that's cleaned up pretty well, then what I need to do with this or what I'm going to do is once again, just utilize some runner pieces just cause well, let's just assume that maybe you guys don't have plot plate or don't have access to plot plate easy enough to just use the runner that you have included with the kit, it's the same material, all it is is just plastic styrene, but this is not going to fit into there, unfortunately. And basically the only reason why I want to fill this is just because it's an empty space. And I'm going to want the strongest connection between these two pieces as possible because it does have to support a lot of weight. These two pieces aren't meant to be attached, they are not molded together, so any connection between these just little small pieces like this is going to be kind of weak, so the most we can do to strengthen that is better. I'm first just going to use a couple of drills here to just make that hole wider so that our piece of runner will fit into there. We'll glue that in, sand it down, glue the pieces together, and then I think we'll probably go ahead and add a couple little pins in there as well. So we'll give that a little bit for that glue to dry so then we can cut the ends off of this, file this down, and then we just need to make it so that it should fit relatively flushly here to the side of this part here so we'll have to kind of file that so it's a little bit rounded so it'll fit onto the side of here and once it's all said and done we will need to use a little bit of putty i think just to make it look a little bit nicer not that essential considering it's like on the backs of the shield never really going to be seen if it's a little bit rough it's not really that big of a deal all right so that's dried and i've filed that down so it's got a little bit of a curve there so it should fit pretty snugly up against our piece here just right there like that so i'm going to put in a pin and i was thinking to put in two pins. I'm using one millimeter brass rod here. Just one, two, like that. But I'm thinking I may even separate it into just do three, because, you know, better safe than sorry. All right, so there we go. Our three pins are in place, and this should be a strong enough connection. As you can see, it looks a little bit kind of messed up at the moment, but gonna get some super glue in there, get that set, then fill in some putty, get it looking all pretty. And again, even though it's on the back of the shield and really doesn't matter all that much, the point is, it's going to be in a much nicer spot here, kind of on the side of the arm. Still so kind of sort of to the back, but more off to the side instead of straight up on the back of the arm. So there you go. That's holding on there for now. I'll work on just finishing that piece up. But there you have it, guys. I think that should just about cover some of the main issues that this kit has with the fit, the finish, and the frame. Hopefully there were some useful tips in this video for you guys who have the kit already or were hoping to get the Shinanjo kit, but maybe you've heard about some of these issues and maybe this puts you a little bit more at ease if you're planning on getting the kits, you know, how to go about addressing some of the issues that you might run into if you plan on getting the kit. It's a beautiful looking kit, definitely. I still think I prefer the just overall look and proportions of the Master Grade, to be honest. But I'm looking forward to working on this kit some more. So in this video, we just focused on addressing some of the issues and kind of troubleshooting the kit a little bit. But in the next part, we're going to actually start on doing a little bit of customization to this and then giving it a custom color scheme. So that's what I'll go over in kind of part two of this video. 
which will primarily just focus on my own customized version of the Shinanju, whereas this video was just sort of a general kind of tips and advice, maybe if you're planning on working on the Shinanju in any way. But as always, guys, big thank you to USA Gundam Store for making this video possible. Thank you all so much for the support as well. Check out the link to USA Gundam Store and the coupon code down in the video description below, as well as the link to Mavericks down there in the video description. Thank you all so much for the support, liking the video, commenting, and subscribing is all greatly appreciated. Until next time, hope you guys are having a great day. I'll see y'all later. Bye-bye.